frontal lobe, what we find is there are some distinct things that we're interested in. Uh, on this side of my brain here, you can see this little blue dot represents what we call Broca's area versus this red strip. Uh, and it is on the other side too. Um, it's just not painted red on my, on my brain. Uh, this is the primary motor cortex. And then at the very tip of the brain, this is the prefrontal cortex. And so the prefrontal cortex is just the, the slice right behind your forehead, if you will. And so we're going to talk about the prefrontal cortex, Broca's area, and the primary motor cortex in a little bit more detail. So the prefrontal cortex, just a little slice of brain right behind your forehead, this is the area that, as far as we know, is the latest to develop. It takes the longest to mature in humans, often not maturing until approximately age 25. And this area of the brain is involved in lots of fascinating things, such as regulation of uh, reason, logic, decision-making, uh, risk assessment, and in many cases, our personality. And so what we find here, it's, it's coded blue on the screen, uh, is the prefrontal cortex helps us to uh, be patient, be understanding with others. It's a part that unfortunately is impacted by things such as dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, which is when a person starts to shift their personality. They're not able to keep track of things or make the same decisions. They might become more angry and hostile. And it's important to note that's because the disease is attacking um, and degenerating this part of their brain. Now, when I said this is one of the areas uh, that takes the longest to develop, uh, what we find is uh, in adolescents and young adults, the way they assess risk and the way they think about decisions is very differently than adults over age 25. And you may not be aware of it. One of the things I always uh, suggest to people to think about is if you can recall a time when you were 12 years old, and you think about something you used to do when you were eight and you might think oh that's so embarrassing i was such a i was such a baby when i was eight i would never do that now that i'm 12. and then maybe when you were 16 you thought oh i can't believe i did that when i was 12 that's so embarrassing I, i'm way cooler than that now that i'm 16. and when you're 20 you may say oh my gosh when i was 16 i was so ridiculous i can't believe i ever did that and when you're 25 you may look back when you're 20 and say wow I was ridiculous when I was 20. I can't believe I ever thought that was safe or, or I, that was a good idea. And this, this is normal. This is normal to look back at those ages and see a difference in how you would judge things or how you would do things. That's typical brain development. Now what we find is after the age of 25, this reflection doesn't tend to occur. Uh, I'm 36 as I'm recording this and everything I've done since about 25 seems like a good idea to me. It seems like it was pretty responsible. Is it that I've matured and all my decisions are good decisions? No, it's not. Uh, what has actually happened is my brain has stopped developing, so I'll never get that meta-awareness. I'm at my peak level, and so I may still be making very bad decisions that are reckless, uh, but I'm now unaware of it. And so uh, if you were to use the word um, idiot about yourself, if you were self-critical about yourself when you were a teenager and looking back on your past, it's not that you're now not an idiot. It's that you have just you're now maintaining the same level of idiocracy. Uh, and so you just don't, you aren't aware of it anymore because your brain has stopped developing. Now, one of the reasons we found this out about this area of the brain is through a very unfortunate uh, railroad accident. There was a man by the name of Phineas Gage and he was a railroad worker. And he was considered to be a very patient, lovely, lovely man who was a good coworker, a good spouse. Um, everybody liked him. One day at work, he had a very unfortunate workplace accident and a railroad spike went through his skull. We can see the depiction here. And so it went through the top and it came out below his uh, left cheekbone. And surprisingly, he lived. Uh, he, he, could, uh, he couldn't see in one eye, of course, but he could see in the other eye. Uh, he, his memory was intact, his reading was intact, his math skills were intact, his coordination was intact. People were dramatically surprised and uh, they, started to test Phineas to see if there was any brain damage and they couldn't seem to find any brain damage. And I thought, well, this definitely went through his brain. Why is there no brain damage? Well, then his personality started to shift. Rather than being a very laid back, fun guy, he started to become a very hostile man. He became very angry. He was never one to curse, but now he cursed all the time. Uh, and so we started to see this major shift in his personality and his unfortunate accident is one of the ways we helped to discover what the properties of the prefrontal cortex were. 
Now you can imagine if there was a lack of oxygen in our prefrontal cortex, let's say we were mountain climbing and the air became thin, or if we were uh, drinking a substance like alcohol that would compete uh, in our system uh, for the circulation of oxygen, uh, then we would start to, um, if you start to get less oxygen in your prefrontal cortex, this is when uh, your prefrontal cortex may appear impaired and things like your reasoning, your decision making, your risk taking uh, may be a bit altered. So now we're going to slide over and talk about the primary motor cortex. Keep in mind there's lots of secondary and tertiary motor cortexes throughout the brain too, but the primary motor cortex, the primary area where we coordinate our motor movements is housed in the frontal lobe. And so what I have here is this little red stripe, but it is symmetrical on the other side as well. And so this little area of the brain, what we find is there's different regions that help us to coordinate different components. And so there's um, uh, right up near the, the top here, we have where it coordinates your arm and then your hand, and then your face gets a long segment because there's a lot of different muscles in the face. Uh, and so being able to coordinate that and have uh, conscious control over that takes a lot of brain area actually. Uh, even things like your lips and your tongue so you can speak and pronounce different words definitely takes up a lot of space. And so this is where uh, if this area were to get poked or prodded or damaged, that's where we would start to see that effect. Now you can imagine that um, if there was lack of oxygen uh, to the primary motor cortex, some of the things we might see that might start to get impaired are things like our coordination. Uh, you might move your hand in a more sloppy fashion. Because a lot of this is coordinating speech, we might begin um, to, to start to see a bit of slurred speech. And the third area of the, of the frontal cortex we want to talk about is Broca's area. And so Broca's area, it, for most people that are right-handed, it is going to be on your left frontal lobe. So, uh, and so this is the little area right by the temple. This is the primary area that helps in the facilitation of the production of speech and language. So everything I'm saying right now, my Broca's area will be working overtime uh, to produce these videos. It helps us with spoken speech, but it also helps us uh, to produce signed languages and help us to write things. So if you're typing things and you're composing things on a computer, um, perhaps even composing things on a piano, uh, then, then this is also involved in the production. And so if you can imagine the reduction of oxygen in Broca's area, well, that may lead to things such as slurred speech and may lead to people not remembering the right word. I know myself when I'm tired, um, if I haven't gotten enough sleep, I tend to misspeak and say the wrong word. Uh, and that could be a facilitation of lack of coordination or lack of awareness depleted resources uh, to my Broca's area. After the frontal lobe, now we're gonna move back to the top of the head and we're gonna talk about the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe, this is an area, rather than looking at just our motor skills, uh, it's going to look at things like hand-eye coordination. That means if you're going to throw a dart, or if you're going to draw a picture, uh, even if you're going to try and touch your nose, your hand-eye coordination might be involved in some of those things. So your spatial awareness comes into play with your parietal lobe. In addition, if the parietal lobe is damaged or has lack of oxygen, our hand-eye coordination would suffer. And so this would be if somebody is trying to unlock their front door with a key, they may miss the, the, the lock a few times. Uh, if they're trying to dress themselves or try, trying to do something, put, put something down on a counter, put their keys down on a counter, they might miss. Uh, and so we see this lack of coordination starting to take place. In addition, the parietal lobe houses a, a really interesting primary area known as the primary somatosensory cortex. So the primary somatosensory cortex illustrated in here on the blue strip of my brain, uh, but it would be symmetrical as well on the other side too. It kind of mirrors the primary motor cortex. So the primary motor cortex helps us with the coordination of our arms, our legs, our face muscles. The primary somatosensory cortex is where we get sensation on the skin for these different areas, where we feel that we are being touched. And so uh, we have here a very detailed diagram. You don't need to know the details in that diagram, but it's essentially showing that there are different components. Now, interestingly enough, one of the big takeaways is that the legs, although our legs take up a big proportion of our height and a big proportion of our body, legs get a relatively small segment on the primary somatosensory cortex, but the face gets a relatively large zone. In fact, the lips, the lips get a humongous zone. We can see them there, the big red band. Uh, and so this is the idea that the lips are very sensitive uh, and that are, for some reason, being sensitive to where our lips are is important to the survival of our species. And so we've developed a large area. 
We can also see the yellow band in the illustration is where our hand sensitivity is. So the sensitivity of our fingers and our fingertips, uh, lots of different uh, spaces for that represented in our primary somatosensory cortex. Now, if there was lack of oxygen to the primary somatosensory cortex, we could imagine this uh, playing out to be a uh, lack of sensitivity on our skin. So you can imagine if someone is mountain climbing or if they're um, consuming a lot of alcohol, one of the things they may start to occur is their, their skin becomes more numb and not temperature related. And so this could be things like uh, they might not feel their face or their face may feel numb or their body may feel numb or, or it might begin to tingle and feel a little bit different. Uh, and so that may be related to competing resources in the primary somatosensory cortex. Now that we talked about the uh, frontal and parietal lobes, next we're going to talk about the temporal lobes. So just right over the ears, if you will. And there's two areas we're going to talk about, and particularly in the temporal lobe, we're going to talk about the primary auditory cortex as well as Wernicke's area. And so the primary auditory cortex, this is um, where we think about sound, uh, music, rhythm and melodies. So this is where we do the primary processing of all things through our sound, sense of sound. Now keep in mind there are secondary and tertiary cortexes too, but this is the primary house for this stuff. Uh, and so this is where you're going to uh, really understand uh, pitches and, and beats um, and all kinds of non-musical sounds as well. It's where you're going to decipher uh, different things like, oh, oh what, what was that ding or was that a doorbell? Um, if where you can also look at sound echolocation or where you try and find uh, where a sound's coming from. If you hear a mosquito, trying to locate the mosquito. And so if this area starts to get a lack of oxygen, one of the things we might see is somebody struggles uh, to hear or they may need the volume to be increased on different things so that it can get the... Um, the volume increase, more neurons are going to fire, so the sensation will be more intense so they can hear it. So somebody is consuming large amounts of alcohol. Uh, one of the things they may do is they may crank up the volume on the songs they want to listen to uh, because they, they need uh, the stronger stimuli. And then we have Wernicke's area. So Wernicke's area, um, colored a little bit differently on my brain and then what's on the screen here, uh, but this is considered the language uh, comprehension warehouse. So Broca's area in the frontal lobes where we produce speech, where we can produce speech, but Wernicke's area is where we comprehend it. Important to note that when you're talking, we're often using both of these. Often when you are producing language, you are second, second guessing and making sure what you said makes sense. And so this is the idea uh, that when you were constantly speaking, you're going to be fact checking. And if you misspeak, your Wernicke's area will tell you and then your Broca's area will help you with that. But you also use Wernicke's area when you're not the speaker, when you're the listener. So it helps you with listening to spoken language, uh, to understanding and comprehending signed languages, and to reading. Uh, and so it, it's a really important area that helps us with the comprehension of language. And so it could be possible, for instance, for a Wernicke's area to become damaged, but a Broca's area not to be. In that case, people could produce things, and sometimes they might make sense, but they would have no way of knowing if what they're saying makes sense and they'd have no way of comprehending other people. Uh, if you had damage to your Broca's area but not your Wernicke's area, you could understand people, you would just have a hard time talking yourself and you'd be very aware that you weren't saying the right things. So that would be an instance when someone's stuttering and they can't get it out um, and they, they want to say it, but they're having trouble eloquently producing that language. And now we're going to talk about the fourth major lobe at the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. And so the occipital lobe, one of the main things we talk about with this, is the primary visual cortex. So the primary visual cortex, this is where we're going to uh, process most of our visual information. And there is specialized neurons back here that help us to detect things like faces and patterns. Of course, this is also where we're gonna break down where we're gonna see brightness and colors and, and get all the information from our eyes like that. Uh, but also, if somebody is playing sports, let's say, and they get hit on the back of their head, one of the things this can do is a physical impact to the back of the, the back of the skull can actually make the phenomena of seeing stars. So that is, it's putting pressure on the occipital lobe, and it's the idea that you might you might see stars if you hit your head. Now, if the primary visual cortex is damaged or has lack of oxygen, we could begin to see blurred vision. Uh, a person may not be able to see things clearly, uh, that things may become more wobbly. 